uh, a first homework assignment. Uh, it is not due this week because I want to give you guys a chance to think about it. Seven questions. It runs from pretty straightforward, I think, to some slightly harder questions. Remember, this is still not a proof-based class. So if I ask you to show something, what I'm really looking for is kind of informal arguments about like why what's happening is happening. And you're going to get the flavor of that in some of the way that I talk about some of the things I do today. So the questions are there that are more conceptual are in this set because this is a field that is much easier to use if you understand conceptually why we're doing what we're doing in the background. Right? And so the stuff that we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is used all over applications. Um, I guess I, I hadn't thought about it, but we could have a, you know, people are still interested in uh, having days where you can sit in here and work on problems together. Um, I think that went pretty well last quarter. I'm happy to do that again uh, this quarter, especially because my intention is to make this class uh, collaborative the whole way through if I can. Um, particularly because my intention is to ask more interesting questions. They're going to be more difficult, and so more time, more collaboration, I think, is helpful for working on those things. Um, and uh, it also helps me pick out ideas maybe that weren't clear when I asked them in class. Um, so that's posted. Uh, so I'm going to pick that up hopefully on, um, if you guys have it done by Monday. I'll have another exercise set that I built this week, and it will probably like be like that through the quarter, where if you get this set done, you can start working on the next one. Um, all right, are there any questions about anything else that I can answer? Yep. Work on paper or online? I, you know, probably for the st from the standpoint of helping me keep track of, uh, of and I didn't even occur to me to do this last quarter uh, for some reason. I would probably ask that people, uh, you can do it on paper and then upload it to, it will be easier for me to keep track of it's uploaded to Canvas, so I'll just put an upload link up there so people can scan stuff or use, um, what is the thing that, uh, uh, is it Lens is the Microsoft application? I don't know if you guys have used that before. Microsoft Lens has a nice PDF maker where you can just use your phone camera to snap the PDFs, email directly. Um, I would ask that you don't overload my inbox with, uh, with emails with attachments because I have a sea of calculus students that are hammering me constantly and so stuff gets lost. Um, okay, uh, as far as office hours go, um, I've been trying to figure out a good time to do it. I really want to split my office hours from calculus and complex analysis this time. Uh, I didn't realize the extent to which it was going to be uh, a tangled mess in the, in the last quarter for this. So uh, I understand from earlier conversations that a lot of people have a class from 10 to 11. Um, as I'm aware that, or I believe anyway, that there are no math classes from 11 to 12, I think. I think that's the sort of department, sort of like they carved out a spot. Now, they use it for meetings. Uh, but department meetings tend to happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so probably for this class at, at a first go, um, we could try sort of, so let me make these tentative. Um, because I'm going to be asking homework to be due on Monday, maybe I'll have a Monday office hour. So it's like Monday from uh, 11 to 12, then I teach from 12 to 2. And then uh, the other one that if I'm going to do this and try to keep it away, so I can go after 2 o'clock, say any anytime between 2 and 4. Um, I don't really have a strong preference on this. I don't know if there's any, are there classes, like sort of big mainline math classes in the afternoons? 41, 412 sequence, linear algebra is the sort of classes that you guys would take. I know I can't cover the GEs, like there's no way I can deal with all that, but are afternoons generally okay? 1 to 3? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so why don't we do, for now, um, maybe a good day would be something like, Thursday from 3 to 4, if that's reasonable, something like that. For now, um, I can always add more. Um, I actually enjoy having people come by for uh, uh, discussions in this class. So I'll be available by appointment as well. I'm going to take a picture of this so I, I can get my camera to work. And I'll post that when I get back to my office later. Right, and any other structural concerns? Okay, so when we left off, we were talking about, 
I think we defined a set of automorphisms. Had I defined uh, conformal equivalence yet? Okay. So that's what we're going to pick up today. So we've built up the idea of what a bijective, so the sort of su subject so far, has been uh, bijective conformal maps. which you can think about as uh, invertible maps that preserve local geometry. That sounds like a mouthful, but that's really, this is just a bunch of definition words, and I want you to think about what this is actually doing. The bijection here means it's invertible, and conformal, you can think about is that it preserves local geometry. That thing where it takes tangent vectors and it just rotates and stretches them. It doesn't actually change the angles. So you can study the same sort of physical systems in a rigid way if you're willing to transform your domains using uh, conformal maps. OK. So if I can find such a map between two sets, that's a pretty big deal. So here's a definition. So two. Domains A and B in the complex plane are called conformally equivalent if uh, there exists. idea here is that you have some set A, and you have some set B, and there's an F that gets you from A to B, where not only is F invertible, but we also have conformality as well. And just to be clear, because I got a couple questions about this, everything we're doing is in the context of complex function theory here. Okay? So all these conditions about differentiability, uh, are like Running around in the background here is the idea of analytic functions and complex differentiability. Okay, so we're not secretly working in R2. All of this is with respect mm -hmm. to complex function theory. Okay, so the idea is that um, the reason we call these sets conformally equivalent is because working on this set is essentially the same as working on this one, because you could either let's see, draw the picture that's more revealing about exactly what I mean by that. <laughs> So let's suppose uh, that we were trying to study some function on a domain A. Right? So let's let G of Z be some function from A into the complex plane. Where I'm working in this picture right here. Well, if A is, uh, if A is bad for some mathematical definition of bad, and B is good, we don't ever use the word good, so nice. I don't know how nice and bad are opposites of each other, but they are in math classes. If A is bad and B is nice, then we can work in B, and say A and A and B are conformally equivalent, Then we can work on B as a domain instead. Then we define a new function uh, I guess we can call it G hat of Z. And what should G hat of Z do? Well first we get rid of the bad domain and we transform into the good one. So first let's use, apply F which is the, the conformal map connecting A to B. And then we compose it with the original G. So what this does is it takes elements in A and it sends them to elements in B. 
guess here, uh, sorry, this is the wrong way. Uh, let's have, if f goes from a to b, and uh, I need to use f inverse here, right? Because f inverse would take elements in b and send them into elements in a. G goes from A to C, and I want to compose that with a map F inverse that takes B and spits out elements in A. And then it would make sense to do F inverse first and then G, right? So this takes elements in B, spits them out into A, and then G takes those and spits them out into the set G of A. So you can chain up your function on a bad domain with a transformation that makes a good domain instead. So here you think this is the bad domain, and this is the good one. The idea is that this composition is a function on a nice domain. But I haven't destroyed any information about the derivatives when I did that, because this is supposed to be a conformal map. Actually, I'll show you a typical trick here. I'll give you a concrete example, because this is kind of vague, of the way that this stuff shows up in practice. So one thing that we're going to show, actually, if you want sort of a preliminary exercise, and you haven't been in my office hours and heard me do this before, um, the upper half plane And the unit disk are conformally equivalent. Now, I am asserting that without any proof or argument in the exercise to you is figure out why that's true. In a, in a couple of lectures, you'll actually be able to just write the map down. You, you don't get What's that? You can claim that if you like. That's essentially what's going on in the background. I just want to lose control. Yeah, but that's not going to get you the upper half plane. So, what I mean here is that if you have the upper complex half plane and its boundary is the real axis, that you can conformally map that into the unit disk where the real line gets mapped into the unit circle. And the upper half plane gets thrown into the unit disk. These are sets that are conformally equivalent. Now, that, that might seem really weird, right, that, you, that this is true. Because somehow we have to fold this set in on site of itself. But remember, conformal maps are local maps. It means that if you had some little tiny xy coordinate system in here, that there's a way of taking that little tiny xy coordinate system, wherever it happens to be, and it might rotate, but it's going to transform into another local xy coordinate system over here. Okay. So I'm asserting this without proof. And we'll have the proof once we start studying linear fractional transformations. So here's a, an, a, an early exercise. Figure out why this is true. This is not homework, but if you're if you're bored and you want to think about what's going on inside here, there's nothing better to do than good old complex analysis because you never want to see another epsilon or delta again. Here's a way I'm thinking qualitatively about mathematics that doesn't involve that. Okay, so if you have the upper half plane in the unit disk, I'm going to make another assertion here. I'm going to write down a function f of z. is equal to 1 over 2 minus z. No, you're not. Let's do this one instead. About, uh, we'll do 1 minus z over z minus, oh, that's lame. Uh, I'm going to do it in this in this form, z minus alpha over 1 minus alpha bar z, where alpha has modulus less than 1. I was going to be concrete. So you can pick your favorite complex number with modulus less than 1. So 
So you pick an alpha inside the unit disk, you plug it into this form, and my claim is that this function f takes the complex unit disk into itself. This is a function from the unit disk to itself. Yeah. That's the alpha bar. It is. What's that? Well, so alpha bar here, so you, what you should, we're going to spend some time thinking about this function later. One thing to think about what this function is doing is that it's, uh, it has a zero at alpha, and it has a pole at one over alpha bar. So, I mean, this has a simple pole, right? It's got one place where the denominator is equal to zero. Functions in this family have the property that if you drew the unit disk, they have a zero uh, inside the unit disk at alpha. So at alpha, the function is equal to zero. And at one over alpha bar, you have a pole. So alpha is a zero, and one over alpha bar is a pole. And the reflection that gets you from alpha to one over alpha bar is called the circle inversion. It takes the inside of the circle and it flips it around to the outside, or the inside of the disk and takes flips it around to the outside. So disk goes across the circle to the outside. These are a special family of functions. So this, you can actually write down that if the uh, if you feed it a unit modular value, that you get a unit modular value out. Okay. But suppose that you don't want to work on the unit disk. There's various contexts in which that's not an appropriate thing to do. Maybe this is what came out of the problem because you're, you're studying functions that have bounded behavior. But there's really nice behavior. Suppose you know, you're in engineering class and you don't ever do disks. You do half planes instead. It's typical in an engineering class. It's like you always transform out of disks into half planes. How could you do it? Well, if there's a conformal map that gets you back and forth from the unit disk to the uh, upper half plane, which I guess maybe we'll call, how about, uh, how about capital lambda? You guys, are, you guys are mature students, so if I want to write capital lambda, I'm going to. <laughs> OK, so what would happen if we start composing this thing with lambda? We know that f takes the disk, inputs in the disk, and it feeds out outputs in the disk. I'm drawing the arrows backwards because that's the way we write composition now, right? How could I make a map that goes from the upper half plane to the upper half plane instead? So I'm going to call this set um, D for a complex unit disk. And I guess because we're using fancy letters and this is a half plane, maybe I'll call it H. I'm allowed to do that. H for half plane, D for disk. What's that? Oh, wait. Lambda is the function that gets us back and forth, right? And lambda is the function that takes us from H to the disk. So lambda is our sort of bijection, our conformal, our bijective conformal map that gets us back and forth. How can I take that function lambda and use it to turn f not from a function from the disk to the disk, but a function from the upper half plane to itself instead? Yeah, so on the front, I have to get from H to D, right? Yeah, so, so I better have a lambda in the front, because lambda will take in half plane values and spit out values in the disk. And I want to have H to H instead, because engineers love half planes. So I got to get back to the half plane again. So I'm in the disk right now. I got outputs in the disk. So I have to go backwards through lambda. And that will get me back to the upper half plane again. This is the typical application of conformal maps. Now, this works for any invertible map, right? Any invertible map will have this property. But uh, the reason that we want conformal maps particularly is because conformal maps preserve all that low, the differential structure is preserved by this operation. We haven't destroyed anything about the way the derivatives map. And derivatives are, when we're studying physical systems, derivatives are really important. So we don't want to destroy information about the derivatives. There's no guarantee that an invertible map won't rip the set to pieces when you do the derivatives. So the idea is, this is essentially a function. You can call it, I don't know, f hat, if you like. f hat is an equivalent function that exists in exact one-to-one -one correspondence with the functions on the disk. 
We didn't destroy any information about the way it treats derivatives. And these functions could be studied using the tools that work for half plane functions instead of disk functions. Right? Now, I know that some of you have seen this before, but it's important if you have not seen this kind of transformation theory, this is why we do this stuff is that it gets us the ability, uh, you know, a lot of this math was originally motivated by the study, it's a mathematical discipline, but it was originally motivated by studies in physics and engineering, precisely because you can do this thing where you can transform domains and ranges, but preserve local differential structure when you do it. So it shouldn't surprise you that if we could do these sort of things specifically, that we could transform problems that need to be solved from one domain into other domains where the tools are better. Okay, is this okay? Questions about this? The issue is, I didn't tell you how to find the formula for this. That's what this exercise is about. So you could actually write the formula down that does this. And we'll learn how to do this when we learn the linear fractional transformations. So generally, from a theoretical standpoint, it's awesome that you can do this, that you can take one domain and transform it to another domain if you knew the formula for the function that actually does the transformation. Because if you were working with a concrete function and you didn't know the actual math that did it, well, great, in theory you could do it, but what good does that do if you actually want to do something concrete? So there's two questions that need to be answered. Uh, one is, how do you compute the maps? And the second is, okay, well, these are conformally equivalent. What are all the other sets that are form formally equivalent to these? Right? The fact that I can go back and forth here means I can really think of f as being sort of this object where I can arbitrarily change the domain and range as long as I'm doing it conformally. Right? So the next question we're going to answer is, what can we say about the sorts of things where I know such a map exists? And that's the subject of a big theorem called the Riemann mapping theorem. All right, am I good to erase this? Everything okay? Okay, well, any time a theorem has a, has a name. connected. I'm going to go back and talk about what a simple connection means, but A cannot be all of C. Um, then, there exists a bijective conformal map F that takes A to the unit disk. That sounds absurd on its face. Every simply connected set is conformally equivalent to the circle, or to the disk. But it's better. Because if you tell me what a single point does, then the map is unique. Moreover, Uh, for any fixed Z naught in A, um, we can find a unique such map F with F of Z naught equal to zero 
and the derivative at z0 being equal to some positive number. OK. Now, the annoying thing about this theorem is it doesn't tell us how to find the thing. right? But it essentially says that all the simply connected sets that are not the entire complex plane are the same set. Geometrically the same set. We should be careful about here. They're not the same, but geometrically they're the same. Why do I mean that? OK, so first let's write the annoyance down. So the annoyance here is that this is an existence theorem. And existence theorems are where pure mathematicians and applied mathematicians part ways. Right. So that's an existence theorem, which is annoying. But it has this sort of profound consequence that tells us like, something about our study of ooh, I'm gonna skip this. Take that. It's probably mine, since I don't see the pink one in here. Um, but there's a sort of profound corollary to this. Remember that conformal maps, when you chain them together, stay conformal. And if you have a conformal map, its inverse is conformal, right? They're closed under composition, and they're closed under inverses. And so a big consequence of the Riemann mapping theorem is that all the simply connected sets that are not all the complex plane are all conformally equivalent to each other. Any uh, simply connected domains, remember all you mean by a domain is path connected and uh, uh, open. Any simply connected domains, uh, A and B, neither one of which is C, are conformally equivalent. And that means you get to do this kind of proof. So the Riemann mapping, so since A and B are simply connected and are not equal to the complex disk, are not equal to the complex plane, um, then that means that by the Riemann mapping theorem, they must be conformally equivalent to the disk. So we have some set A that is simply connected. What does simply connected mean again? The sort of informal way of thinking about it? Yeah, or the even more, no holes. no holes, right? Yeah, so every curve homotopic to a point is what I'm going to talk about a little bit. But yeah, no holes, right? Set with no holes in it. Any set with no holes is conformally equivalent, maybe we'll call this lambda 1, to the complex unit disk. And then over here, we got some other weird set, B which is also simply connected. Path planes with wiggly, with wiggly boundaries are also simply connected, as it turns out. There's no holes inside this set, right? So this thing is conformally equivalent to the disk. By the Riemann mapping theorem, both of these have conformal uh, bijective con uh, conformal maps that like, take A to the disk, and there's a different one that takes B to the disk. Why are A and B conformally equivalent? You just run the arrows all the way through, right? So this is kind of more sophisticated, but no deltas or epsilons, notice, so you can't be mad at me. So the reason that you can get a map that's bijective conformal map from A to B is because you can just pass all the way through both maps to get from A to B. First, you do lambda 1, and then you compose it with not lambda 2, but with lambda 2 inverse. Lambda 2 inverse is a conformal map because conformality is preserved by inverses. And lambda 1 composed with lambda 2 inverse is conformal because conformality is uh, preserved by uh, uh, composition. So yeah, that's, that's actually the proof. This is the best kind of proof. Yeah? So the, the Riemann mapping theorem, is that like something that we do? So the Riemann mapping theorem has kind of a complicated proof. Um, it's essentially just an argument by set theory. I'll have a proof of it in the notes. 
Um, but it's it, the flavor of it is a little different than than kind of what I where I want things to be. So the things that we're going to prove in here are things that I think reveal structurally what's happening with the function theory. And the Riemann mapping theorem is essentially an argument from set theory. It's just you know that you've got that non-zero derivative, and you can like just it's a topological argument basically. So if you're interested in seeing it, that's the sort of thing where um, I can. I'd probably be more willing to make a video about why that, that, that proof is true so that I can make it optional because I think it goes slightly beyond the scope of what I want to cover in class, but um, because again, the flavor is just not quite ready. But if you want to see it, I'd be happy to record something. So you let me know. If you don't, because you're like, oh, I don't care about that, then that's totally, that's totally fine too. So if you want a reference for the proof of the real mapping theorem, there's a nice argument in the Marsden and Hoffman complex analysis book. And I read it and thought, 25 or 30 minutes on this for ideas that we won't use again are not really worth my time. So, or yours mostly. My time, everything's worth my time. <laughs> okay, so this kind of argument where you can draw a picture and draw some maps, that's totally legit in here, right? This is the sort of thing that I would consider to be a proof of a, a conceptual question like this in this class. Okay. Now, I've said the word simply connected a bunch of times. I want to give a slightly um, uh, a slightly beefier idea about what simply connected means. Because we're saying any two simply connected domains that aren't C are conformally equivalent. I really need something more um, concrete that I can write down with simply connected other than no holes, or just saying that curves can be like continuously deformed to points. So let's remind ourselves, I'm going to give a, an updated definition of simply connected. So a domain is simply connected if for any simple closed curve A in A. Uh, I should give the curve a name, so let's call it gamma. The domain A is simply connected if for any simply clo uh, simple closed curve gamma of t uh, in A, gamma of t can be, I'm going to continuously formed to a single point, uh, let's say Z naught in A, without leaving A. That's actually with uh, the definition that you gave, uh, but I'm going to, we're going to, this is a mouthful. And sometimes we're actually going to want to write down something more specific than just a bunch of words about what it means. So all of this blather right here about continuous deformation without leaving the set, there's a word for that. Oh, gosh. What did I, what did I say wrong here? What's in, what? It's not you. No, no, no. no. When I, when I, once I start writing like this, like, I've been trying really hard to like, not write in my occasional lazy uh, handwriting here. Gamma of t can be continuously, continuously deformed to a point z naught contained in A without Hopefully that's clear. All right. That stuff, the word that we use for that is uh, homotopic. These are words that you should be familiar with because I'm going to be throwing them around you know, like when we go further. But we're never going to write actually, a, we're never going to write one down. We're just going to assert that they exist. So given curves gamma 1 
and gamma 2 contained inside of some set A. Here you can think any curve, really. Two curves contained inside of A. Um, a homotopy from gamma 1 to gamma 2 is a function, continuous function, H of two variables, S and T. Now, this is why we never write these things down. I just want to indicate to you that like this sort of object gets thrown around all the time at no level of uh, specificity beyond this. So it's a continuous function H of S and T with S contained in the interval from 0 to 1. I guess I should be careful here. I will never write them down in more specificity than this. You guys may have actually had to write homotopies down in other classes. So we have an S parameter that ranges from 0 to 1. H of 0 of t spits out gamma 1 of t. So if I put in 0 in the S variable, the first curve falls out. Then I bend and distort things by running through the variable S until I get to 1. And then gamma 2 of t falls out. So the idea here is I have this parameter varying from 0 to 1 where the first endpoint is the first curve, and the second endpoint is the other curve, and h of s and t stays inside of A uh, for all s. This is one way of running down what a homotopy is. So a function of two variables that's, I know this is a little abstract, but the idea is the values of this thing are curves. Time parameters go in, curves come out as the range element. These are a complete pain in the ass to actually write down. If you've ever had to do it, uh, I feel for you, because this is about where I bounced off this kind of topology. And so gamma 1, let me draw a picture real fast here. You've got some set A. You have that set A. You've got a curve living inside. Maybe we'll do a picture in the middle here. So the idea is that if you have some curve, gamma 1, this is also H0 of t is equal to gamma 1 of t. So the output of H is the curve. Then time travels along, so S moves. Uh, S changes. And maybe here at h one half of t, some sort of different curve pops out, right? But the idea is that whatever has changed there is done continuously. It hasn't broken the curve. It's contracted it without breaking it or splitting it or twisting it. I mean, twist a little bit. But like the idea is somehow that we're not leaving the set, nor are we breaking the curve. So if it started closed, it stays closed as we, keep, as we continue traveling. So maybe this is h one half of t. And I think we call this gamma one half. And then finally, when we get to the end, at h1 of t, maybe we've got just a single point with the output, which is gamma 2 of t. And the idea is that if you made this snapshot with more pieces, you could see the curve slowly, slowly collapsing down to the single point. And even if we never write down the, the formula for the function that does it, it's useful to have the function notation so that we can talk about composing it with other things. So we can use the fact that homotopies exist to study when simple connectedness is preserved by function. Yep. Okay. So if such a function exists between two curves, then we say that the curves are homotopic. So gamma 1 and gamma 2 are homotopic in A if there exists a homotopy in it, a homotopy H. How do you say homotopy? H taking gamma 1 to gamma 2. Okay. And so another way of defining what it means to be simply connected is to lose all the language about about continuous deformations and staying in the set and just say instead encode all of that in the single word homotopic.
And this is useful. So two sets or a set is domain, since we're in complex land, there's an a domain. A is simply connected if every simple closed curve in A is homotopic to a point. It's the easiest way to say it, but it means to be simple. Yep. Uh, so I'm I think that I'm kind of wondering whether or not this implies that a domain is simply connected purely. I'm thinking about like an example in my head. I'm not sure if you can dispel any misunderstanding sure. misunderstandings that I may have. So if my A has two blobs in Ah, it, but it can't because when we talk about domains, so okay, running around in the background here is that domain all it has connected stuff into the definition of domain. So two blobs, we've eliminated the, so what you're saying is, what if A has a blob over here and a blob over here, yeah. and then you've got like, uh, you know, it can't be on the top to this point over here, right? Yeah. So we've actually, we're not gonna allow ourselves to consider, with simple connected, when I say simply connected, I'm always going to mean a set with one blob. Okay. So I can avoid ambiguity in the definition. Because then you would say, well, okay, over here, all these can be homotop to points, and all these can be homotop to points, but there's something weird about the fact there's two blobs, right? So we're not going to consider simply connected sets that aren't also connected. It's a great question. Okay. But we've eliminated that possibility by saying domain. So when we say domain, we mean uh, an open connected set is also half connected. So we're only considering sets where you can go from any point in the set to any other point in the set with a continuous curve. Good question. Okay. So, you got an example of a, uh, a set that's not simply connected? What's that? The torus. That's a good one. The, the torus. Come on. Better than that. In flat and flat, so you're you're working in two-dimensional complex geometry. The annulus is sort of like the, the the 1D version of that. So yes, a torus is definitely not simply connected. It's got a hole in it. Okay. Um, so all of the sets that we've been considering, if you think about uh, like the the definition of all these things, if you think about disks, disks are simply connected. So these are going to be examples here. And Half planes of any kind are going to be uh, simply connected. They're path connected because you get from any point in the set to any other point in the set with a curve. They're simply connected because any loop that you draw in this set can be continuously contracted to a point without leaving the set. There's no holes. So now the, my question is, why do we, and this is a sort of a big conceptual question that we're going to talk about when we talk about the classification of domains. Why have we excluded the possibility of the entire complex plane? So here we've got a disk. Here we have half planes. Here we have all of C. So all of C is pretty obviously simply connected, right? No holes in the complex plane. Why have we, why do you think, do you have any feel for why we have cut it out of the picture? Yep. Because the only reason to have the whole plane is if you let the curve go off to infinity, because okay. otherwise you can contain it in a finite section of the complex plane. Okay, so that is absolutely along the, thr the thrust that I want people to make. So the point at infinity is definitely involved, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you remember the last quarter, that's exactly what's happening here. So the idea is that. This thing has two places where it has a boundary, way of thinking about it, right? 
The complex plane does not include that point at infinity we talked about last time, where all lines pass through the point at infinity. So this has one piece of the boundary on this, on this line that splits the plane up into two pieces. It cuts the plane up into an inside and an outside. And this cuts the plane up into an inside and an outside. Where are the inside and outside of the complex plane? It only has an inside. It has no outside. So somehow the fact that the boundary of the complex plane is the point at infinity means that this is a different animal than these guys are. There's no inside and outside here. There's just inside. So from a geometric perspective, remember I, I, I gave the spiel about the Jordan curve lemma, one of the hardest topological theorems, which says that every simple closed curve has an inside and an outside? Well, there's a simple closed curve, and it has an inside and an outside. And there is a simple closed curve, if you allow the point of infinity, and it has an inside and an outside. But there's no inside and outside here. So this has no curve that chops the plane up into two pieces, and so it must be different somehow. This is going to motivate reintroducing the Riemann sphere for real this time when we get there. Okay. Not quite yet. But yeah, so this is the, the reason that the theorems exclude this case is precisely because of that. And I actually have a homework, maybe not a homework question, but there's an exploratory question. In fact, did I give you the homework question? Oh, I did. Question seven. The Riemann mapping theorem concerns that they're not all of C. Is there a conformal map from C that is one to one onto the unit disk? Is there a conformal map of D one to one onto C? To give you an opportunity to think about, like, can you get conformally from the disk to the whole plane or from the plane to the disk? Okay, there's another question here that needs to be answered, which is, what happens to the functions at the boundary of the domain? Just because I am analytic on the interior conformal on the interior does not tell me I'm allowed to plug in points on the boundary. These are open sets. Everything's defined on open sets. Boundaries are not allowed to be evaluated, which is too bad because you got this. If you actually have a function, like one of these guys, it's annoying for me to say, oh yeah, that function is analytic on the unit disk. And that's it. I can tell you what you could do with circle values. Just because you're allowed to work on the fuzzy disk, D, well, you say to yourself, well, that's a perfectly good formula. Why am I not also allowed to plug values at the edge of the disk into it? And if I did so, would the function be continuous? By continuous, what we're going to mean is if, I'm taking a, if a function is taking a limit, um, as, it, as you start in the disk and you head out towards the boundary and you look at the sequence of values the function is spitting out, when you get to the boundary, is the value at the boundary the same as what it looks like the function should be taking on? Not really useful to do calculus if you have no limits at the, at the edge of your domain, right? So the question is, why can't I plug these in? Why can't points on the edge be plugged in? a map, especially a conformal map. They're so, oh, they're so rigid. They preserve geometry and they're analytic. Why can't I just use the same formula to, to, I mean, the best thing to do would be to say, maybe I could just see that this is a circle, write my formula for my conformal map down, figure out what the image of the circle is, and say, oh, well, since the circle got mapped to a line, all i got to do is figure out where the inside of the set went. So. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about boundary behavior. And then once we have the boundary locked down, we're going to start talking about the specific transforms that get us from domains to other domains. And these simple types, disks, half planes, and their, and their, and their relatives, like, um, like quarter planes even. Because remember, that's also simply connected. All right, so um, we're going to get more concrete. But it's a, this is the sort of way that you should be thinking about these questions. This is a combination of if you get a concrete example, you can compute with it. But broadly, the reason we're doing conformal maps is because we can do these, these big, vague transformations on lots of different kinds of sets, which motivates the theory. All right, I'll see you guys next time. I'll promise I'll warn you in advance if we're going to do epsilon synthesis.